welcome everyone to tonight's episode of profoundstates.com or profound states uh, i'm your host charles michael mike beaver and our tonight's guest is charmian uh charmian redwood is it pronounced like an s charmian or? yes it's charmian charmian redwood mm -hmm. she is an author uh, oh god here, I'm not prepared. Hold on a second. I don't have her bio right in front of me, so let me uh, bring that up and we'll get it started. Okay. Here we go. And now you can tell I'm not professional. Charmian had an NDE 42 years ago where she was awakened to the truth of who she is. She now guides others to experience themselves as divine essence using hypnotherapy to connect to their own soul and to answer any questions they have about their lives. She is a channel for all of the ascended masters and archangels, and she teaches channeling on Zoom. Uh, Charmaine leads retreats to connect with the soul and to remember lives where we were much more powerful and conscious beings than we are now. Charmaine's books include uh, Coming Home to Lemuria, which is this book here. Uh, uh, Eric, can we see it? Uh, yeah, we can see that. Uh, let's get, oh my God. That yeah, is, it's a bit blurry. That's better. Oh. Right there. There it, there it is. That's about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's hard to do. It takes a special. There we go. That, that's it. Yeah. Coming Home to Lemuria. That's one of her books, which I have read. And I recommend it. Everybody go out and get them a copy right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, that book tells us where we came from and how we lived in harmony and peace on earth, on the earth. Uh, things making weird noises here. Coming home to Lemur. Oh, yeah. Uh, a New Earth Rising, which is another book she has, uh, takes us forward through the ascension into the healed earth where all is restored to harmony. And at Mary's Table, a uh, third book, uh, is an account of the life of Mother Mary taken from past life hypnosis. She offers light worker development training online, as well as training in her hypnosis technique called Authentic Self Hypnosis. Her website is www.cominghometolemuria.com. Welcome uh, to tonight's episode, Charmian Redwood. You are now cleared for takeoff, and uh, <laughs> uh, feel free to uh, elaborate on your intro as much as you feel like, if, if at all. Well, the way it all started for me, uh, not, well, the past life, the, the near-death experience was the real beginning. But how my book came to be written was that I moved, I moved to Hawaii in 2006. I actually moved to Hawaii on 666, which for me was an auspicious day. And uh, I started doing my sessions, hypnosis, with just people I met randomly. And all of them, every single one of the sessions, people were just going back to Lemuria. And at the time, this was 2006, I knew nothing about Lemuria. I knew I was one. I knew I was a Lemurian. But as very little is written about Lemuria, I, knew, I didn't know what that meant. <coughs> but from doing all of these sessions, I got so much information about who they were, where they came from, why they came and how that that time is connected to now. That's the really important part, is that in, in Lemuria, which was before the fall, before we separated from our divine essence, which we used to live at and from, we didn't know suffering. We didn't know pain. There wasn't any. We lived in as all of our divine essence, we lived in it all the time. And then we went through this process of separating, of disconnecting from our 
golden cord that always was connected to oneness. We went through this long, 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 long cycle of basically dumbing ourselves down, losing consciousness. But fortunately for us, now, in this time that we're in, we're at the completion of that cycle where the earth is returning to oneness and we've all come back, the Lemurians have all come back to help with that process. So it's a very important, this is the most important lifetime for all of us and it's our last lifetime in terms of linear time that when we go through the ascension process, we won't be doing the dying and the aging and the deteriorating and all of that. We're, we'll be living in the light as divine beings uh, once more. Oh, you're, you're, I'm not hearing you, Charles. Did you, looks like you're muted actually. Yeah, I did, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just in case something happened, I muted myself, which is not always yeah. safe. It's not always safe to do the safe thing. Um, uh -huh. So, you said that you um, you had that you knew you were a Lemurian before you did any regressions of people who came up with their Lemurian mm -hmm. lifetimes. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How did you first come to know that you were Lemurian? The very yeah. Well, through through meditation, I, I was living in Glastonbury in England, which is kind of the spiritual center of England. It's like the Sedona of England. And I had a good friend there who has since left the body. And we used to sit together and channel almost every day. And we went all over the universes. And one of the 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 places or the beings that we would communicate with were the Lemurians, but not very much. So I, I knew they were there, but I didn't really know any details about the civilization, just that they were very loving, conscious, peaceful people. But how did you know that you were one of them? How, how did you come to that? Because when you when you talk to these beings who are on the other plane, uh, they tell you that we're family. We are your family. We're family. So you just know. You just know. It's an inner knowing. So, did you did you pick up that you were Lemurian before they told you? Did you actually know it before they said it? Or did no, you say no, it? Did you I know only, because they said it? No, yeah, I only knew it because of doing these channeling sessions with my friend uh, that these Lemurians came and, and said, you know, you are also, you're one of us, you're, you're Lemurians. So when you were channeling with your friend, did you do the channeling or did she do the channeling? Yeah, or you both did, did channeling? We both did it. Yeah, we would sit together and we would open up and then whoever wanted to come through you know it was pretty crazy it was kind of star trek stuff well i remember one time we had to rescue some pleiadians who'd been locked away in a time lock by these dark extraterrestrials and they'd been there for thousands of years and then we were they asked us to to, to let them free to set them free uh, can you please tell that story? I want to hear more. I want to hear more about that story. Well, it was just one day. We every time we sat, we would go to the stars. We would go to other universes. We'd channel White Eagle or Native American teachers, the Druids, and so the we were just meditating, and these Pleiadians kind of came into our consciousness and told us that they had been locked in a time lock by what I call the dark robed priesthood. They're the ones that took over all of our temples and civilizations for power, for self power over 
and then they imprisoned and enslaved and destroyed them. So they had they had put these Pleiadians in the time lock, but because of all the guides and the angels that we worked with, my, me and my friend Varley, we worked with the councils of light, with all the masters, with Archangel Michael, whoever, we would just call in whoever we needed, so, and with the Galactic Federation. So we were able to uh, get this time lock uh, um, melted, disappeared, opened, and then the Pleiadians were able to go home. I think that particular time we called in the Galactic Federation and they, they helped us to set them free. So you didn't undo the time like yourself, you got other help doing it. Do you know, I can't remember, it was what, 20, 30 years ago? Uh, I think we probably asked uh, Michael and the Galactic Federation to uh, open it and set them free. So do you remember that day, uh, how that, the details of how that all played out? Uh, Not clearly. It was 30 years ago, and I didn't think of it, about it at the time. It's just what we do. What I mean, do. okay, so when the when the awareness of the Pleiadians came in, mm. did, you, did you, like, see them, you know, I'm, I've never channeled. Yes, so. they, were, they were kind of in this pillar of light uh, that was... Um, a tube like a tube and uh, there was no way out and they'd been locked in there so they couldn't they couldn't get out so when you saw them in the tube of light okay so you did they did you hear them say we're locked in this tube of light or did you know uh did you no, just they spoke they spoke to us and they said we telepathically been, Yes, in, in our meditation, they spoke to us telepathically and said we were, we were shut away in here by these. They're, they're the, the extraterrestrials that are, have been trying to control this planet for a very long time. And uh, they, they locked them in there. And can you please help us to get out? So the... You said dark robed. Did you, is that what you called them? That's the, what I call them. They're the the ones who took over Atlantis and destroyed it. They took over Lemuria and destroyed it after the fall. They infiltrated into all of all of the temples, the pyramids in Egypt, in India, and they um, they want power for self. And we, who are the the children of the light, we only do service. We, we did not have a concept of power for self. We didn't know what it was. That's why they were able to infiltrate our temples in Lemuria and in um, Atlantis and take them over and take us over and then destroy the whole civilization. So did... Um, there's a lot of kind of controversy. Nobody knows, A, whether Lemuria ever existed, or B, whether Atlantis ever existed. There's no proof that either one of them existed, but that I'm aware of. But um, there's also a lot of controversy. It, you know, let's say for argument's sake that they both existed and everything you said is absolutely true. I've no, I don't have any re I'm not a real skeptic anymore. I used to be, but uh, but uh, who who existed for Lemuria? Lemuria was first, and it was a continent where the Pacific is now, and Atl Atlantis is was where the Atlantic Ocean is now. So Lemuria, the beings came from the stars. They came from, this is all in the book, Coming Home to Lemuria. They came from the Pleiades, Sirius, Andromeda, Arcturus, Lyra, Venus, many, many star systems. And they came because Gaia called 
the children of the light. She wanted to be lifted up. She wanted to raise her vibration. So she called to us because we are all, we come from a much higher vibration than we are living on on the earth. We are not third dimensional beings. We are fifth and up, fifth and higher dimensional beings. So she called us. So first of all, we came to Lemuria more as light beings than physical. We were not in very physical bodies. We were in very ethereal bodies. So we could shape shift, we could flash in and out, we could um, create from our minds just by thinking about anything. We could manifest from our intention. And we, we built these beautiful crystal cities just by, by thought. And um, we lived in harmony and peace. There was no competition. There was no, um, I'm better than you, no, no trying to, to um, overpower another. It was just, I can create anything I choose. We have everything we need. So how can I help you? How can I serve you to, to do what you want to do, to get what you would like to do? So the Atlanteans, uh, I know you go over all this in your book, but you know, even though I read your book, I don't necessarily remember a lot of it because okay. you know, anytime you read any book, you're not going to remember most of what you read because no. it's just the way the human mind works. We uh, we keep things in our mind for just so long and we dump it, regardless of what it is, unless it's something, um, you know, like like the day the Lemurians, or not Lemurians, the uh, Pleiadians, when you set them free, you'll never forget that, that event because it had a lot of meaning for you and mm. a lot of details. Whereas if I'm reading a book, it's just, words on a paper that has no depth and you know what I'm saying it's it's not mm. it's like well, somebody's what, face what, versus, I, what, versus. what I find with the book is that when some people read it it resonates with them so much that they email me and say oh my god I just totally lit up because I knew the information in that book almost before they read it they just knew that was true and it spoke to them because they are Lemurian. So that's right. what people uh, uh, feel connected to the book. But it's different for them because they're recalling what's already, they've already learned from their past life. No, no, they, they haven't. You see, that's the point is they read the book and they didn't know anything about Lemuria. Like me, they might have heard the name but they knew nothing. They didn't know they were a Lemurian until they read the book. And then it was like, oh, my God, this is my story. I know this story, even well, the, though previously they'd never even heard of it or read it or anything. That's essentially what I was saying. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I probably didn't say it pro uh, properly, but they, didn't know, they did not know they were Lemurian, but the book reading the information, you know, you read each piece and you're like, oh, that sounds familiar. And, you know, each little piece is somewhat familiar to you, you know, in a vague sort of way. Yeah. And after you've read so much of it, then you realize that that's something you have in your past, but it's not something you knew until you read it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. Yeah. so it obviously... So it ha obviously has more meaning for somebody like that because they mm -hmm. they have experienced and forgotten it and been made to forget it by coming into this incarnation. So, um, so um, I don't, I'm trying to think of which direction we should go with this. So, well, let me just say that that's my job. That's my work. All of my work is helping people to remember what they have forgotten 
when they were way more conscious beings than we are now. Generally, we are living at a fraction of the capability that we have. We are not using our powers uh, in the way that we did in Lemuria, in Atlantis, in Egypt. So that's all of my work is to trigger people to help them remember and then using the classes and the, the hypnosis sessions to actually go into the memories and make them real, make them uh, vivid and real. So uh, I realize that that's what you're doing, but when they come to you, what is a typical uh, hypnotic client, hypnotherapy client come to you for? What do, they, what do they ask for before you do that for them? Do they say, well, I want to know what I was before I came here. Uh, you know, take me to a past life, or what, what do they look for? No, they usually say, I read the book, and it totally resonated, and uh, I, want to, I want to know, I want to remember. That's it if they come through the book, but I've also got lots of uh, videos out on YouTube channeling all the masters, the archangels, the... Uh, star people, so it's not it's not only Lemuria; it's all kinds of stuff. But you had you had a hypnotherapy, hypnotherapy practice long before you wrote the book, yes? Uh, yes, yes. This is only the Lemuria part. Yes, I I'll tell you I'll tell you how it began. That would probably be a good thing to do. I'll tell you about my near death experience because that is Please. what. That's what woke me up literally overnight. It was uh, 1980, uh, 42 years ago, and I'd just given birth to twins, boy and a girl, Gemini twins. And at the hospital, it was a hospital birth. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong in every department. So I ended up with very severe blood poisoning. I had this internal bleeding that they didn't notice, they didn't see, and it all got infected. So I was rushed back to the hospital when the twins were 10 days old. And the first night in the hospital, I experienced leaving my body, floating, looking down at the body in the bed. None of me was in that body. Not one single part of consciousness was in the body. All of me was the one that was looking at the body. And I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. I wasn't, didn't know what meditation was. So it was very clear that the body is just the house that I live in, but I am not my body. So then floated away from the, the hospital room, floated up and just up and up and up and up. And it was very easy and it was very peaceful. There was no fear at all. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew there were angels there. And I, at the time, I was not even into angels. I didn't have any consciousness of other realms, uh, n nothing. I was a really normal person. And then I'm in the next minute, I'm floating in this golden light. And as soon as I got into that light, it was like being enfolded in everything you could ever want. Love, forgiveness, acceptance, abundance, just everything you could ever want or need was just surrounding me in the golden light. And, it, and, it, and I knew this is who I really am. This is home. This is where I came from. This is where I'm going when I finish my earth mission. And this is where I want to be. And everything down there that the body is doing is just a story. But it's not real and it's not who I am. So I'm floating there in the bliss, in the oneness, in the golden light at the source. And then Jesus appears in front of me. And I was not a Christian. I, I'd been raised Methodist, but I'd never had an experience that was spiritual that I could say, you know, I, I know what, what 
the, the consciousness Jesus brings. So he's looking at me and I'm, I'm going, I'm not one of yours. Uh, are you sure you, are you sure you're looking for me kind of thing? Because I'm not a Christian. And he just looked at me with complete forgiveness, acceptance, pure love, no judgment, n nothing negative at all. Everything I'd done in my life, I might that I might have thought, oh, that wasn't a good idea. He was just like, don't worry about it. So we, we had this conversation in my head telepathically. And he said, because your heart is pure, if you want to, you can stay with us in the golden light. But we are asking you to go back because the world needs your love, your wisdom and your healing. Well, at the time, I didn't have any. I didn't know anything about anything what I do now. But I said to him, how can I go back down there knowing that this is where I belong with you? So his heart was this blazing blue star. It was just so beautiful, a blue light, like electric blue light. He took a piece of his star and he put it in my heart. And he said, now you will know that I am always with you. So the next minute, I don't remember agreeing to come back, but I must have done. Because the next minute I'm back in the hospital room, floating over that body, knowing that if I get back into that, which is not me, I will take on suffering. If I stay out, which is me, I will never suffer again. But I'd just given birth to twins, 10 days old. Father wasn't really very keen on children, made it very clear I'd invited them. They were my children. So there was no way I was going to leave my babies without a mother. So I came back in for them. And then the next kind of the next morning, I just woke up and ev and remembered that what, what where I'd been and everything that had happened in my life up to that point the career I was a school teacher the mortgage buying a house my life plan completely meaningless utterly meaningless that my degree you know all my achievements in, in, in the human realm I just knew that there is a plan for this earth that is lifting it back to love and light I didn't know what the plan was. I do now. I didn't then. And I just said, wherever you need me to be, let me know and I will go. So I've literally been traveling for 35 years. I've lived all over the place. The other thing that I said was, I want a way to take people to experience their golden divine essence, their soul essence without all the drama of the near-death experience and all. So just over the years, first I found that I could do laying on hands and uh, healing people with my hands quite spontaneously. And then while I was doing healing on them, I started talking them back to the light. So it was this hypnosis kind of evolved itself. I would just talk them back to the light and it became very clear that the place we needed to start each journey was by going into the golden light. So that's what we do first. And then we go to a past life that will help you to understand who you are as a being. Then we bring the soul into the body, uh, activate the cells, activate the DNA and look at what's blocking so that's where we find the wounded self, the, the trauma. We take those parts out, release the old pro the programs that are keeping you limited. And then we go into the future. Now that the soul's in the body, what do you want to do? How do you want to show up? So then we look at how our life will be when we have embodied all of our soul, which is actually what the ascension process is is just bringing more of our own divine essence. Most people have 
between 30 and 50 percent of the soul in the body at any one time. As you evolve in consciousness, you bring in more and more and more of the soul. And so enlightenment or ascension is when you've got all your soul into the body. So that is that is how I do the sessions now. I call it authentic self-hypnosis. So um, we go into everything. Lemuria is just one thing that we do, but we go into everything. So that's how I've got all this information about Atlantis, about the stars, about other universes, through through doing the, all these sessions for 35 years. So do you teach your own techniques or do you? I do now, yeah. Just Only just last year. I was doing a session for a lady, and as part of her session, she said her soul said to me, you need to start teaching this so that people can pass it on when you've gone. <laughs> so I just start, I've, I've done two, I've done two trainings, and I'm about to put together another one. Yeah, so I do, and I do it online. I do it all on Zoom. So... Is the soul and the higher self one and the same? No, they're not quite. They're very similar, but they're aspects of, of, of the divine essence. So what I've experienced is that the, the body's here, the higher self is closest to the body, the physical, the soul is the next level, and then the very highest level is what I call the I am presence. <clears throat> That's the part of you that always lives in the oneness, is always connected to the oneness. <coughs> so you don't have any concept of the oversoul? The oversoul. Hmm, what would that be? Um, not, no, I don't, I just don't use those terms. I don't put it in those terms, but that would probably be the same as the I am presence. That's the highest level that we, we, that I, I have put a term to. So, um, you do hemotherapy. Um, okay. So let me see if I get this straight. You... Take them to the into the light first, mm. the first step. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when you do, you mind uh, explaining your the details of a session in more detail? Is that okay? No, absolutely. Because this is this is why the sessions are so life changing. Is because not not just knowing I am a soul, because everyone knows conceptually that they are a soul. But when we go on the in the sessions, you actually experience it. So I take people up to where they're just floating in oneness. And when I ask them what that's like as part of, of the, the journey, the session, they say it's peaceful, it's free. I feel free because they've, they've gone beyond any limitation of any kind. So then I take them to ex feel their consciousness expanding out and out and out. And when they realize what a huge powerful creator being they already are then it changes their whole life view instead of looking at things down down at the ground they start looking from up here from the eagle eye view and it changes the way you feel about yourself about the world and about your life so you don't let people mess with you when you realize what a powerful and, and divine being you already are. This is what is a surprise to people because we're, we're living now the legacy of religion where it's been stressed that we have to spend lifetimes on our knees begging and supplicating and praying in order to become 
pale reflection of the divine. Basically, the shift that's happening now is we've spent thousands of years on our knees at the altar worshipping the god, the goddess. Now we're being told, now you are the goddess, you are God, you are the ones you have been worshipping. So the first part of our journey, even if you did none of the other stuff, this would be life changing. When you actually experience yourself as a creator being, it's uh, you can't you can't uh, put it can't put it into words how much that changes people's um, perception of themselves. Because that that was my whole point was I didn't want people, I don't want to just tell people you are a powerful being. I want them to experience themselves. And then nobody can take that away from you because that's what happened to me. Do you ever do you ever have clients that um, that you have a hard time? Yes. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell, 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 us, tell us about uh, one or more uh, client that you had a hard time with, how, how you got past that, or maybe you didn't get past it. I don't know. I can't uh, predetermine what happened in that session. So tell us about one of those sessions. Well, a couple, a couple of people, I take them to the place where we're going to, I, I ask them to imagine they're floating up in a pillar of light and they're going into the oneness. And then I say, where are you? What do you see? Well, I'm still in the body and I don't see anything and I haven't gone anywhere. So then I have to work really hard trying different imagery instead of floating up, I'll take them up a stairway. Very, very, very few people can't get anywhere. Uh, so, so, and because I'm also a channel and a psychic, uh, I can also just create a journey for them to follow that is not interactive where they're not, the whole, the whole point of, of the, mostly what I do is that it's interactive. So I take you to the place where you can experience your divine self, but then you're telling me, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm seeing. Well, some people just can't do that. So then I will channel a, a journey for them or messages for them. Because I also do channeled readings from all the masters. So it's usually very left brain logical analytical people who just won't let go they won't let go of the conscious mind well okay so if uh, i think i'm probably one of those people <laughs> i was gonna say I, but I, is this why you're asking <laughs> uh, i um have visualized in my head colors one time in my whole life mm. but aside from that i've never seen anything in my head even though i've had i've uh, how do i put this i've bartered with uh, quite a few other hypnotists where i would you know these were people that lived in the same city as me so i'd mm -hmm. go over to their house and i would do a session on them and then they would do a session on me or vice versa and uh even though i've uh, put myself in trance and other people put me in trance hundreds of times. I've never once been regressed uh, to anything ever, no past lives, nothing. I've never been regressed. I can't see anything in my head other well, than. Well, you don't have to see. I have to say this it's not all visual. Some people are visual and that does make it easier, but some people are kinesthetic and they get feelings. And other people are clairaudient and they kind of hear uh, sentences, hear thoughts. They just get thoughts suddenly come into their head. So have you had any of that? Well, I, I have uh, some psychic talent. I'm not like somebody you'd pay to, to be a psychic. But I mean, I've never spent a lot of time developing my psychic talent. It's just natural that... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I have a very strong intuitive. Some people call me psychic. You know, I've had people, a number of people in my life who were not into 
anything that you and I are into. They're just average people would say would call me psychic. Mm. So I do have talent in that area, but I've never spent the time developing it. And so, um, you know, it, whatever talent I have, it's just my natural talent. And it's stronger than the average person, but not maybe not as strong as somebody who uses it on a daily basis to make a living in. But that that doesn't matter. If you've got it there, then then there must be a block. There must be something that is blocking you from using it. Because if you've got any psychic ability at all, then it's, somehow it should come out. But you know what I've found from doing the past life regression for a, a long time is that many, many lifetimes we were persecuted, very creatively put to death for being spiritual, for speaking out at the wrong time, for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I'd say about 70% of people I work with now have a block on if I show myself again, if I speak again, if I show them who I am, I will be destroyed. So we have to, we have to work with that block and, uh, and release it. So how do you feel about attaching spirits? Oh, entities. They definitely are entities, absolutely, yeah. So of all the clients you work with, um, how big a percentage of them do you find have attaching spirits, relatively speaking? Not not very many, no. that I don't tend to attract uh, people with a lot of entities. I tend to attract people who are... Uh, seriously on a spiritual path who want to experience their consciousness so some of some of them have entities but uh, generally uh, we we can get them to leave by exposing them to unconditional love um, we don't banish them we enfold them and bring them into the light I've tried that a few times and mm. hasn't worked for me <laughs> yet. Well, sometimes I will call in uh, Mother Mary, Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, and ask them to to escort the the spirit up. If it doesn't want to go, we'll ask. I'll call in the big guns, and they will help. Have you ever had somebody who had attaching spirits who you could not? remove it um i've had one client that i've been working with for a couple of years and she has so many of them that we we just keep working through them and then not, not more common so that's that's a work in progress but generally we can generally we can but it's not the focus. It's not my my focus is holding a mirror for people to see all of their potential, to see the highest and the best that they can be and have been. It's not so. This is not new. You know, we've done all this. We've worked in the temples. We've trained in the temples. But you see, what's happened is that in the past lives. In the mystery schools, we would spend, like in Tibet, in Egypt, in Greece, we would spend 15 years training. We would be taken into the temple at the age of five, and we would be trained in, into our 20s. And so we've, we've done, we've already done all of this work. So this lifetime, it's really fast. You can literally wake up in a, a couple of months just because it's more a matter of ripping off the band-aid that is keeping us asleep and just uh, uh, opening up, embracing it. So, see, I, I, I taught in all the mystery schools. I've always been a teacher and a trainer. So what I find in this life is all of my students who I've trained in other lifetimes Greece, India, Celtic, um, Egypt, Atlantis, Lemuria, they come back, they, they work with me for a short amount of time, and they just really step into uh, 
their truth and their power. Some, some stay for a long time, but not very many. Most of them just take, do some sessions, take some classes and then move on. So how many of your students are, how many of the people you, you just started teaching your technique very recently. Yeah. yeah so how many, yeah. how many students do you have that are actually doing what you do so far? Uh, only seven I did. The first class had five who were students that had been taking my online classes for a long time. And then I, I just did one that was two. So it's very small, but um, it, it, it's building. So uh, uh, how, when did you first start? You said you had your first class very recently, right? Yeah. Uh, when was it? They all graduated. Uh, a year ago, they graduated last February. And how many? How many uh, session? Is this a group session or individual? Yes. What well, what it is? It's just, it took me a long time to create it and to write it. So what we do? It's on Zoom. It's all done on Zoom. It is eight classes of three hours each, and it's a lot of practicing. You see, what, what I learned from myself and from my other students is that a lot of the other trainings, you're watching people doing sessions, but you're not actually doing the sessions as part of the training. And I know that this is, this is true of uh, some of the other, other people doing hypnosis. So the way I've set it up is that in every session, you're, we're in breakout rooms and you're actually practicing the scripts uh, on, on each other in class. And then we have the opportunity to discuss it and uh, evaluate it. So, it. so by the time you've taken the eight classes, you're very confident to be able to give a session. So what you do is you, you get an even number of people uh, not necessarily, students. not necessarily. No, if, if it's an odd number, I will. The first group was five, so I one of them would work with me. Every okay, week. so it doesn't have to be even. All right, so um, so your prices are on your website? Not for those classes, because I, I just put them on when I... Uh, when I posting one, because I'm in the middle of moving right now, I would have been doing one now, but I, I'm I'm moving house and everything's a bit chaotic, so I'll probably do one uh, around May, probably around May. So then I will post it on my website. the The prices for the sessions and the readings and all the different activations. I do a whole lot of activations of. Uh, twin flame, uh, releasing negativity, forgiveness, abundance, all kinds of specific uh, activations. So yeah, how, long have you, how long have you been channeling? Hmm, 35 years, 40 years. So and pretty you, much since I came back from, the, from heaven. Yeah. Okay, so was your first channeling session, do you remember your very first time you ever channeled? Well, what happened was uh, I was going to a meditation group and then I had this guy came, lived in my house and this was 1986 and the, the meditation group that I went to, the teacher received uh, guided journeys. He channeled journeys for that particular day. They just came to him and through him. So this guy that this other guy was living in my house and then and he started a meditation group because he was a sannyasin he was one of osho's guys and then he left and um all these people were coming so i just took over the group and i just found that i was channeling the journey so that's pretty much the way i work i'm given journeys and i'm and some of those journeys are connecting with masters, with angels, with extraterrestrials uh, to, uh, and then people I channel or in the class, everybody channels. 
So you teach channeling and? Yes, yeah, I teach channeling. That's what, when I talk about my Zoom classes, that's what they are, is that we, we teach, uh, I teach channeling because I had a message, don't just do readings for people, don't channel for people, teach them how to do it for themselves. See, all my work is about empowering you to be who you are, because I know who I am, and I don't need apprentices and disciples. I want you to be all that you can be, so we can all play together. So, so when you teach uh, how to do the hypnosis, where you take the people in the light, that is totally a separate class from yeah. learning how to channel. Yes, that is a training. I call it a hypnosis training. And that is teaching you how to lead a hypnosis session. The channeling, uh, we, all, we all do it together. It's the same process that I do in my sessions in that it's interactive. So in the sessions, I'm asking you, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What's going on? Well, in the classes, I start off, I take us where we're going, which I usually don't know until I start talking. I, I see the pictures and then I'm speaking the pictures. So then we all go to that place. And then I'll say to them, what are you seeing? So then everybody is describing what they're seeing. It can be a temple, it, and then we start to connect with the beings who are in that place. For instance, I'll give, I'll give you an instance. The class that I'm doing right now, we're, we're visiting seven earth, the earth chakras, the seven chakras of the planet. So the first one is Mount Shasta, which is the root chakra of the earth. So in that journey, uh, I do it two different times, two different classes. We go into the light city underneath Mount Shasta, which is called Talos. And it is actually a Lemurian civilization that has been underneath the mountain since the end of Lemuria. We go into Talos. We meet Lord Adama, who's the high priest. And then we, we go to this place where we... We're taken up to meet all the ascended masters and hear what they want to say. We hear the messages for them from them. So we're always taken through an activation of the light body. We're always taken through a clearing of the junk that we've collected from the third dimension. And then we're always connected with beings who speak to us and give us messages. So it's very high frequency. A lot of people keep taking my classes because it says they say it keeps their vibration high because we're working at such a high frequency so you're saying that channeling is something that keeps you vibrating at a higher frequency well the places that we go to when we when i'm channeling the oh, so it's not the chat it's not the channeling it's the it's the, the journey. Places, it's the it's the places we yeah because I work at a very high frequency, which is why I don't have big classes. I have pretty small classes because they're very personal. I like to keep it uh, under nine, so we we develop a very personal connection and a family. Yeah, and we go we go to really high dimensional frequencies. So you're in the middle of a channeling. Uh, class. Yeah, I just started one. We're we're on the third. We're going into the third week. And you're moving uh, from where to where? Well, I'm I moved out of LA because I I, I only moved to LA six years ago because my daughter lives there and she started popping out babies. And I'd always said to her, when you start having babies, I will I'll be there. But now the the babies are. Um, they're all born. <laughs> and so I've moved about uh, just north of Santa Barbara, about an hour further up the um, California coast, called a place called the Central Coast. And it has extremely strong portals um, that are Lemurian. So there's a whole community up here. 
of people who are very conscious and it feels like we're recreating a, a Lemurian community up here. So that's that I'm in the process of uh, moving up here. Oh, so you you moved up there into a room that's like yeah. a six month lease. Yeah. Now you're looking for, or you found a house, or no? It? I'm I'm still looking for a house because where I moved from in Oxnard, north of LA, uh, house prices are much lower. What's happened here in the Central Coast is because of COVID and people working from home, everybody moved out of San Francisco and LA, where prices are ridiculously high. So the prices have gone up here. So I'm going to have to wait until either the prices come down or something uh, appears. But, you know, I'm always looked after. I always get what I need because I don't I'm not I haven't kept anything back. I, when I came back from heaven, from being in the oneness, being with Jesus, I just said, let me serve. So I didn't make any exclusions. Just wherever you need me to be, I will go. So they always sort it out for me. They always, I have so many miracles you wouldn't believe. Because if you give your life to spirit, then they take care of you. That's a very profound statement. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, Okay, so how many of your past lives do you are you aware of? I think I've probably done uh, over a thousand. I, I think I've remembered all of my lifetimes. So how many of those are here on the earth, on this earth? Oh, no, I mean on the earth. I mean on the, this planet. Oh, God, I've been everywhere in the universe. You see, th this is in the book uh, Lemuria, the Lemuria coming home to Lemuria is that we, as the star people, not everyone on this earth is star people. There are earth people who evolved with the earth. They're the ones who were the cave people. And, uh, you know, it says in the Bible where the sons of the gods mated with the daughters of Eve or something like that. Basically, the star people, we came down in waves and we seeded this earth, we, we put our uh, genes into the gene pool so that when the time came for the ascension, which is now, everyone who is now on this planet has like celestial material in their DNA, which is enabling them uh, to make this shift. So w when we knew we were going to do this journey on the earth where we would lose consciousness where we would lose vibration and go down to the third dimension which is not where we hang out normally we we went to many stars to learn all the technologies and the consciousness that we would need to do this very difficult mission on the earth so on the, in the pleiades we learned all about crystals. In uh, our Taurus, we learned light and sound. On Sirius, which is where my home star, on Sirius, we worked with uh, Master Jesus, Ascended Masters, creating the Christ flame, flame of Christ consciousness, and that we brought from the earth, to the earth from Serious. So we've been all over the place. There's a whole, whole lot of different uh, beings, all living here uh, on this planet at this time. Well, um, so you remember all of your li uh, past lives? You've recalled all of them? I think, I think so. I, I can't think I've had many more than I've remembered so many thousands of them. So how many times do you think you've been on the earth? Uh, oh, well. Um, Relatively speaking. Well, yeah, since, since you see, the thing is that it's hard to say because in Lemuria, before the fall, 
we weren't really in linear time. We were not in chronological time. We were in um, spherical time that that we're now going back into. We're now going out of. Uh, I say I'd probably had. I say I probably had. I don't know, ten thousand lifetimes. Uh, basically, I've been here forever. I, I was one of the ones that volunteered to stay with the earth. When we went through the fall, we were given the choice. You can either stay with the earth, disconnect the golden cord, fall asleep, forget who you are and start suffering, or you can go home to the light. So I was one of the ones that volunteered to stay here. So I've been here from the beginning. <coughs> And I don't actually I don't know how many times I've been here. Feels like way too many, but there you go. But you remember lives you've had on other planets as well, correct? Oh yes. Yes, my favorite is Venus. <laughs> I have a whole family on Venus that I still you know, it's not we're in we're in a physical body here on Earth, but we also have parallel lives in other forms on other dimensions including other planets and other stars so i have a whole family on venus venus was actually like the staging post in our solar system where we gathered we all came from the different stars we gathered on venus so that we could be completely infused in the love vibration before we came to Earth, and then we then it was a short hop from Venus uh, to planet Earth because relatively they're pretty close together. Uh, with the dolphins and the whales, I might add, it, it's not only humans that are extraterrestrials on this planet. Say again? It's not only humans that are the star people on this earth this is one of the when, when i first moved to hawaii i'll, I'll tell you that story because it's one of the miracles that i had i was living in uh santa fe uh 2006 and and i was making a vision board with my friend on january 1st for what i wanted for that year and big part of the, my vision board was snorkeling in aqua blue water uh, in Hawaii. And so I, I cut out a picture from Hawaiian Air and I did not realize that on the top of my vision board, it said, follow me home to Hawaii. And my friend said, do you realize you put home to Hawaii? And I said, no, I just wanted to go on a vacation. But what happened was, one of my friends from California moved to Hawaii, to the big island, and she was very lonely. Her husband was working, he was in construction. She was at home on her own all the time. So she invited me to come visit. And as soon as I got there, she took me to this bay, uh, Kialakakua, and this whole pod of dolphins just swam right up to where I was standing. There was hardly anybody else there, which is very unusual, but it was raining, it was cloudy, it was four o'clock in the afternoon, most people go in the morning. And these dolphins came and they just said, get in the water. So I jumped in the water with them, there was about six of them, and I just started to cry. I just could not stop crying because they were just beaming so much love at me and they they said we are your family and you need to move here and i had no thought of moving to hawaii so i said i said i would love to move here but i'd need a miracle because i got no money I, at the time i just rented a place i it's only recently that i owned a house and uh, so i got out i got out of the the water and that night the, my friend took me to a shamanic drumming circle. There was only me, her, and one other woman. So when we were doing the journey, this lady was drumming for us, the dolphins took me on a ship 
up to Sirius and showed me where we came from, that there's this the Christ flame on Sirius and that there was this whole plan that a whole group of beings from Sirius were going to bring that flame to the earth and we could choose. Some of us were going to come as humans and we were going to fall asleep and forget who we are. Some some would come as whales, some dolphins, some as cats, some as dogs. And the deal was that those other beings would not lose consciousness. They were not going to forget who they are. They agreed to stay on the earth to help us when the time was right, when the circle was complete. They would be helping us to remember our full consciousness. That's why the dogs and the cats come live with us in our houses. And it's why so many people are being called in the last 30 years since this ascension process started, well, more like 50 years now, uh, to swim with whales, swim with dolphins. Every, everybody wants to swim with whales and dolphins. And that's what they're doing when we're in the water with them or when we hear the sound or when we look into their eye. They are activating light codes in our DNA to help us to raise our frequency, to raise our consciousness. So, uh, you have worked with many alien races and, and archangels and you channel uh who do you channel i mean you when you when you chat it sounds like you channel all kinds of, of yeah. uh, beings but is there anybody you channel that comes through regularly or? yes my my main guides are mother mary and master jesus that's why i wrote the book it's called at mother mary's table because they are part of my soul family. We all came together from Sirius, uh, the Christ family, and I was with them when they were here on the earth. And so a big part of my job now is to continue their mission, which was just the way of love. It's just the way of the open heart to teach people uh, the truth of who they are to set them free from uh, misconceptions, especially that the church, the religious groups have created. That's why Mother Mary asked me to write the book, because what has been done in their name is the opposite of what their teachings were. It's not about sin and hellfire and eternal damnation. It's about love and forgiveness, like, okay, you make a mistake, but you don't keep beating yourself up about it. You just say sorry, and you put it right, and you move on. So so I channel them all the time. So when you were on the earth with Jesus and Mother Mary, what, what were you doing then? Well, I was Mother Mary's age, and I was her friend. And we'd both taken all of the trainings in Egypt, in the pyramids, you know, the initiations with the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid at Giza. The Great Pyramid is not a mausoleum. It is not a burial place. The later ones were because the pharaohs tried to recreate the pyramids to have themselves buried. <laughs> but the Great Pyramid was actually a place of initiation. So I, I, with Mother Mary, we were the Essenes. We were all the Essenes. And we, we worked very closely with the Egyptian and we would go. So I trained, I taught the, the girls, Mother Mary and I, we trained the girls. And specifically, we trained them a group of them, to, to be at the crucifixion. If you, if you 
and remember the New Testament, it was the women who stood at the cross because the men had all run away because they were scared. It was the women who held his soul in like we created like this vortex of light to hold his soul so that he didn't feel the physical suffering. And and then when he was gone, um, then we, we could let it go. When he was taken down, we could let it go. So we taught the girls meditation. We taught them to to stay in peace and to connect to the other worlds. For our, we would go and we would go and collect them. We would go find them when we traveled from village to village, um, teaching and teaching, teaching healing and teaching about the, the heavenly Father, the divine Mother. Then we would collect the girls and and bring them back and teach them. So that was my job. So you teach, you teach channeling, you teach um, your technique of taking people into the, uh, into the golden light. And what else do you do besides teaching? Well, actually, now that COVID's over and once I get a home, <laughs> I also teach live classes, which I haven't done for a little bit. Uh, I teach hands-on healing. And when we're doing that, we're using crystals. We're using sound because I also do sound healing with crystal bowls and gongs and bells and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I do these in small groups. And uh, as part of that, I teach them to receive messages for the client, the, the person we're working on. We do it. We work as a group on each person. <coughs> we're doing hands on healing. And we're also getting messages that we share with them when we finish the healing. So you're, so you're teaching medium, medium, mediumship? Mediumship as part of healing. It's right. not just getting the messages because as we do it while we've got our hands on them. So you put your hands on the person, you tune into their energy, and then you wait to hit, see what what you receive it's either a vision or a message that, that people receive so these i do uh, i last year i just i just did one in cincinnati last year i did one in uh, hawaii so so i do travel about and i do those and i do them here in california how long did you say you've been traveling i've been moving around for uh, 37 years So you've lived quite a few different places. I've lived all over the place, yeah. So everywhere I've lived, I have a little group of students and they often invite me to come back and uh, lead a retreat. So that's why I was in Cincinnati just after Christmas because I lived there for a while. In this lifetime, how many places have you lived? Relatively? I think I've lived in about 100. 100, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. And besides Hawaii, uh, what's the most interesting place you've lived out, out, other than Hawaii? Well, Glastonbury. I, I was living in Glastonbury for five years, and that's where I l really developed a lot of my channeling because my friend that I sat with, she was a very good channel, and I was more of a healer. But because we sat together every day, I, then I... She really opened me up to channeling. Uh, but I lived, Santa Fe was really lovely. I lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico for a while. Grass Valley in um, California, Lake Tahoe, really nice. And then I moved all around England, Wales, Devon, Glass, uh, Somerset. Norfolk's very, very nice. That's where so I where have you lived Scotland. outside of England and the U.S.? That's all. That's it. I've only lived in these places. I, you know, I was when I lived in Glastonbury and I was channeling with uh, my friend Barley. We used to talk all the time to King Arthur and the knights and Guinevere and Merlin, because Glastonbury is Avalon. It's where that whole uh, story of the Grail 
is centered, it's where it's anchored. So you're saying that King Arthur was a real story? Oh, it is. Yeah, it was. It was. He was a real person. They were all real people. So we, we were sitting in meditation one day and Arthur and Merlin came and they said, we want one of you to hold the codes for the sword, uh, the Pendragon sword, and we want the other one to hold the codes for the grail. So they gave my friend Barley the sword and they gave me the codes for the grail. And then about a month later, and I just got, let's see, I just got my second divorce, so I, I was free. Um, about a month later, they said, would you take these to America? Because America needs the grail codes uh, more than like, more than England does. And because I always say yes, um, I said, of course. So that that's how my that's how I came to be in America. So what um, what are the codes? What it's just living from the heart. It's the sixteenth chakra, which is the Grail chakra above the body. It's not in the body. And in order to activate the sixteenth chakra you have to be empty of self. You have to just make yourself an empty vessel, which is what, what I do. Everything I do, I just empty myself and say, here I am, empty vessel. What do you want to do? How do you want to use this? So basically, it's a place of living selfless service from the heart. So it never was a physical thing. This, this, this is a misconception. It was not a physical thing. It was a state of being that is a vessel empty of self. So have you had, uh, with all the uh, encounters you've had with angels and um, ETs and, and such, have you had um I don't know, this there's quite a bit of controversy on how many of the ETs are positive, how many are negative, uh, you know, what's how does it all play out? And I could like give you some rundown on how that all plays out, but I'd rather hear your uh take on it. Well, what I've understood, and I've had, I've paid, played my part in this, is that the extraterrestrials who have been trying to take over this planet pretty much from the beginning, that they are being marginalized now, that they are not allowed on the earth anymore. They're not allowed to influence the earth anymore. So, um, I, I just, I focus my attention on creating this, the new earth. So I don't get into the conspiracy stuff because what I've experienced is that negative entities are influencing people through the conspiracy theories to promote fear. And those are the extraterrestrials who are trying to control us through fear. Now, when you meet one of the light extraterrestrials, you can feel it. You, you wouldn't dream of saying, are you of the light? Because if the love isn't knocking you over, then you've got nothing to say to that being. When you meet these beings, there's no question. You, you just feel infused with, with this perfect love. So I have had occasion in, in my journeys and in my sessions to report, to take extraterrestrial to the Karmic Board or to the Galactic Federation. Especially I remember when the cows were being mutilated and there was a lot of abductions going on back in the 90s. And I had several clients who, who had been abducted. 
and we took the extraterrestrials to the, the Galactic Federation and, and said this is a complete violation of human free will and they said yes it is and so it was stopped, it was stopped at that time. So I would say to people be very very careful about getting pulled into the negative stories. It, you know, what, what I found from doing my channeling and doing hypnosis is that everything that happens on this earth is part of the divine plan that is lifting the earth into love. So when, when something happens like COVID, I just say to my guides, okay, how is this part of the divine plan? Well, the answer was, that we needed to stop our world, we needed to stop the busyness, stop rushing about all over the place, being distracted. We needed to stop, go within, and find out what's important. And it's not the stuff, and it's not the, the, um, the amount of status or power you have. It's, it's the love, it's the family, it's the friends, it's the planet. And so people who were saying, oh, this COVID was all a conspiracy to, to oppress us and they're all wanted controlling us, that, it's like, that's not helping. Instead of trying to figure out who created it, it doesn't really matter where it came from, it doesn't really matter how it was created. What I absolutely know is that we needed it, so we called it in. And the people who actually created it, whether it was in a lab, whether it was in China, whether it was on the moon, is, is a distraction. Because we as a species needed literally to be stopped in our tracks because we're destroying this planet. We won't, have an, we won't have an Earth if we don't do something very dramatically very soon. There will be no planet for this, our generation, our grandchildren, the next generation to inherit. So uh, I assume you understand the stories of or the belief that the world is splitting into you know you hear people talking about the uh, uh, world's going to get split into two versions of the earth uh, mm -hmm. one is going to go up and one is going to either stay as it is or go down mm -hmm. and um and some souls are going to go to the the positive one uh, and some are going to the one that's gonna you know go down in flames or whatever however it's gonna play out the the current version uh, i should say mm. um, is that your understanding or it is i don't i don't see it go down in flames you see as we ascend as we raise in our frequency we will no longer be physically deteriorating we won't be physically dying we will be living uh, as immortals. Now, the people who don't choose that way, they will carry on doing the physical stuff for a certain length of time, but not indefinitely, because Gaia has said, I'm not doing the third dimension anymore. So we're kind of in this limbo right now where it's possible to stay on the third dimension but eventually it won't be. So if, you're, if you haven't chosen to make the ascension with the earth, then you will just die in the natural process, but you will not come back to this earth because third dimension will not be an option on the earth. If you, still, if you haven't completed your third dimensional experience, you will have to do it on another planet, not on planet Earth. So I don't see a huge big cataclysm. I just see an awakening of most of the most of the people of the Earth 
and then the rest of them just dying a natural death. And uh, recently, I was listening to a YouTube video of uh, it, it wasn't somebody talking about their near death experience. It was just somebody reading somebody else's near death experience, and um, in that particular uh, story, the person um, whose story was being read said that they went to heaven and in heaven they were shown the year the earth gets destroyed and it's like 3,578. It's like way into the future. Yeah, you see, I don't, um, what, what, I, what I've been shown uh, and this is this is why I wrote the second book. The the book the, the second book, A New Earth Rising, is about the new earth and what happened when I, I'd written the Lemuria book about how it's all love and light and we're all being lifted up and we've all come back to heal the planet and all. And I was getting all these emails from people all over the world saying it doesn't feel like that. It feels like everything's falling apart and I'm really afraid and I'm really worried. So I asked my guides, what do I tell these people? And they said, show them where we're going. So I, I invited people to come and do sessions where we only went into the future and everybody saw the same thing smaller communities back to the land people helping each other neighbors growing food together little little um a lot of um of uh, little communities coming together and pretty much by 2035 most of that will be complete so if the earth is destroyed in 3000 and whatever it is none of us will be on it we'll all we'll all be in a different dimension where we're not affected by what happens on the physical well and, the so, person that, that uh, whose story that was said that there were still humans on the earth at that time even there though. may be not very many yeah but what you said about the future does uh, there's a book called uh, Mass Dreams of the Future by Chet Snow. And oh, I, I know Chet Snow, yes. Do you? Yeah, I do. I met him uh, in uh, Glastonbury. I think he was, at, yeah, he was at Glastonbury. Yeah, lovely man. Yes, that's right. Yes, he, he wrote that book, Mass Dreams of the Future. Yeah. And it, it uh, what's in the, his book coincides with what you just said about mm. the future. You know, what, what's happening now, and this is especially true since the first of the year, 2023 is completely different to 2022. 2022 was very challenging. It was about dealing with the shadow. It was the last year of, this is what I was told, of our whole cycle since the fall where we agreed to hold the light in the darkness. That ended on December 31st, 2022. What we've shifted into to now is living the light, living from our oneness, living our joy. So we're not healing the wounds anymore. We're not taking on the shadow. We are living the light. So what, what I've been noticing myself and what the messages have been saying is that there are a lot of different realities playing out on the earth at this time. So be very careful which one you choose. So me personally, my reality is living in the light. But I meet people who are just really fixed on the negative so they are living their own personal hell. But that's a choice. And it's getting more obvious because things are polarizing, that it's getting more obvious who's doing what. So I, I was, what I've noticed since the first of the year, I was at a, a ceremony, a solstice ceremony. And what, and what I've noticed is that firstly, it's much easier to go through the veils to connect to the higher frequencies. Secondly, 
it's getting much harder to be around negative energy and negative people. I'm really noticing the effect on me. I was at this solstice fire thing on December 21st, and uh, afterwards I was talking to these two women, and every word that came out of their mouth was negative, complaining. And I kept trying to say, but this is good, this is happening and that's good and, and things are changing. And they just weren't weren't ready to hear that. And I just had to walk away because it was actually making me feel ill. So I've noticed that I've become much more sensitive, which in terms of co being connected means you can connect higher more easily. But it also means we've got to take charge of what we allow into our own energy field and keep the negative out. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you're a very un uh, knowledgeable person. And uh, were you in uh, Atlantis also or just in the I was, yeah. And this is uh, through all my, all my um, sessions, this has been the hardest thing. So many of the light workers are carrying guilt from the end of Atlantis and it's really holding us back. Because we, we, were, we were called the children of the one, the Atla Ra. And we were like running, running Atlantis. We were the council that made all, all the decisions running Atlantis. And we, we served the one. We only knew service. We had no concept of power over for self. We only had a concept of power for all, for the good. So we had this um, huge crystal grid. It was a generator grid, these enormous crystals, the size of houses, like 60 feet high. There was a whole circuit of them. And we, we would run the energy through them and then use that, that the power generated to uh, maintain our own bodies uh, in perfect health. We had these flying machines. We, had, uh, we could travel to the stars and back. We had like personal flying machines that you just sit in and it runs off your own electromagnetic energy. And then you just think where you want to go and it goes and it would take you there. So basically we've gone backwards in terms of technology. And then there came a time when the ones that I call the dark robe priesthood, um, they were called the sons of Baliol. They were able to infiltrate our council. That we, we were in charge of that crystal grid. They subverted one of our people, convinced them to let them have access to the grid. They took, took over the grid and we tried to... We tried to stop them. We tried to keep control of the grid because they wanted it power for self. And basically we lost. So they kept running more and more power through that grid and using that personal power to enslave people, do all these mut mutations, breeding all kinds of animals with humans. It was really horrible. Uh, they even enslaved the dolphins and used them to go spy on them. And we kept saying to them, if you keep putting more power through, you're going to blow the circuit. But because they were just drunk on power, they didn't listen. And that's what happened. They blew the whole circuit, caused massive earthquakes. And that's why Atlantis went down. But as it was going down, when we knew it was going down, we um, had an exodus from Atlantis and we took all of our knowledge and technology to Egypt and founded the Egyptian civilization. That was, was a group of Atlanteans who physically went to Egypt. So that's what happened in Atlantis. And, and me personally... Uh, for, I struggled with this for years, like we failed. We, we had this feeling of failure. But now, quite recently, I was told that we didn't fail. It was set up that way 
that we were not a, we were not uh, able to stop the destruction because that was a major soul lesson. Basically, life on planet Earth is about as a soul lesson, learning how to not misuse power. That's what Hitler was about. That was what uh, all of these, the fascists, uh, all the, the way the communists went into uh, fascism and uh, Atlantis being destroyed. That was showing us this is not how you use power. So it was actually part of the plan, but pretty much I'd say 80% of the clients that I have are carrying grief or guilt or both from Atlantis and including some really powerful healers and teachers that this is something we need to clear from the collective unconscious. So you're saying that quite a few of your clients are uh, compatriots of yours. They were... Uh yeah, a lot of my clients are teachers and healers, and uh, I, I help them to uh, move on to a higher level or to um, add things into what they're doing to it. I'm just, I'm just saying they were alive in various. Um, uh, yes, oh, absolutely. It's, it's not. There's nothing new on this planet. We come in pods. We've always come in pods. We have families. We have star families, we have Christ families, we have Egyptian families. All the people we're, we're meeting now, and this is another shift that's happened, that's been happening since 222, 222-22, last February. Uh, what's been happening since we stopped the karma, we stopped the dealing with the shadow, a lot of our experience in this lifetime has been karmic cleanup. We've been in, that's why I've had two marriages that were just a nightmare. It was because any unresolved karma from any lifetime, this was the last life we could clean it up. So a lot of us had karmic agreements to come in in this life and say, raise children with somebody that we had karmic debts to or some some unfinished business. But that all stopped on 2.22.22. So now the people we are attracting are the people that we have the soul contracts with to go through the ascension, to go into the new earth with. So an awful lot of people I know, including me, are moving house or changing relationships or changing jobs because we literally have changed paradigms since last February out of the past just don't have don't spend one minute looking back thinking about the past dealing with the past just it's done shut the door don't keep opening it to make sure it's gone away or it, everything's all right look forward now because we are literally creating the new earth with every thought that we, that we take. So make all of your focus on positive intention for how you want the world to be. Not complaining about how it is, how it was. I, I have three grandchildren. I have three, three of these crystalline children. So all of my focus is what kind of a world do I want them to see? What is the legacy that I want to leave for my grandchildren? You said you uh, enjoyed your time on Venus. Oh, what, yeah. What uh, Venus is obviously not an inhabitable planet as, as on the physical plane, but you must yeah. have been uh, at a different level on Venus. Yeah, we're on a different dimension. Uh, basically, nowhere's on the third dimension. We don't do physical. As beings, we just do not do physical. I don't remember any other existence where I've had a third dimensional. And partly we came to the Earth because it's so beautiful, <laughs> because we wanted to be physical here because of all the water and all, all the green, it's so beautiful. So on, on um, 
Venus, it's all about love and it's very liquid. It's very much like liquid light. We work with liquid light and we we bless, we, we put the power of love into everything. So that's something that we brought from Venus, two things. One is how to bless water so that it can be used for healing and to raise consciousness. And the other was Tantra, using sexual energy to raise vibration, which is what, what it's meant to be used for. It, it, sex began in the temple. It belongs in the temple. And the purpose of it is for a man and a woman to come together in a holy communion where they raise their kundalini together and then experience oneness and bliss together. And so it was meant to be a, um, a vehicle to raise our consciousness. But over the years, and especially since Atlantis, uh, it's become so desecrated. And I'll tell you how I, how I found this out. I was on holiday in Malta, and I went into this very ancient underground temple, like I think it's called a hippodrome or something. And I suddenly went into this other body of like a, a, a not an old woman, but a worn out woman. And I felt as if my uterus was going to fall out. I had to sit down because my whole my body was so exhausted and my uterus was going to fall. It felt old and tired and it was going to fall out. And this was the place where it was the cult of the bull, the Minotaur. It was one of those underground uh, temples to the bull. So I went back to Glastonbury where I was living, and me and Bali sat together in a meditation because I couldn't understand, didn't understand what had happened to me. And what happened was we were taken to Venus, where where the bull comes from and uh, it astrologically uh, Venus rules Taurus uh, uh, we brought the bull the cult of the bull we brought it from Venus as a vessel to teach sacred sexuality it was meant to be using sexual energy to raise consciousness, to experience going into union, into oneness together through sexual energy. And then we were shown that, again, those, those uh, and that's how it was in the beginning. That's where the whole thing of the Vestal Virgins, the ones that, that looked after the bulls, they were pure boys and girls who were, who were very, very pure. And again, the, the black, the dark robe priest came in and slayed. Hello. Uh, looks like we've lost connection. Okay, the recording has started. So you were talking about the um, women being slayed by the... Yeah, the dark robe priest came in enslaved the girls, turned them into prostitutes, and completely distorted the whole energy of the sacredness of sexuality. So basically, they used the, the young girls as prostitutes, and any, any guy 
could come to the temple, pay the money, have sex with the prostitute, and they called it um, taking them to the goddess or, or, or whatever. So it was a complete desecration of the purpose that we brought. We were the people who brought the whole culture of the bull to the earth as a way of transmitting the knowledge of sacred sexuality, br brought it to the earth through the worship of, of the bull. So then that started a whole, uh, what's been going on ever since, is that sex has been taken out of the temple. It's no longer treated as a sacred thing. It is now... Uh, made into an industry and prostitution, pornography, all of that. It's a complete desecration of the original purpose, which was very sacred. So this is something that we now need to um, reclaim on the earth, that sex needs to be brought back into sacredness. And one of the the kind of uh, laws of this this time that we're in now is that sex must always be between consenting adults, not children, not paid, not um, something that you do for a living. It needs to always come through the heart. The heart must always be engaged so that the sexual energy only becomes an expression of pure love. Not, It's now become desecrated, so it's just a physical thing, and it's for physical fulfillment on a, on a material, on a sensual level. But originally, it was for fulfillment on a uh, sacred union. It was meant to take us into union with the divine, by using coming together as a man and a woman, putting our energies together that lifted us both up higher than either of the individuals so we could experience oneness and union with the divine. So it was really a form of initiation, but then it became very desecrated. All right, well... Um... <coughs> I really appreciate you being on the show. I know you're tired, and I'm, uh, it's getting kind of late here, too. Yeah, it's late. Mm -hmm. I got to get up early in the morning and go to work and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do appreciate you being on the show. I will stop the recording, and then I'll figure out a way to patch the two together tomorrow. And yeah, right. We will uh, go from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much, Charles. And I'll, when I've got settled in my new place, uh, we'll make another time and hopefully the internet will be a bit more stable. No, I don't know if you heard on the news, but the Central Coast area had huge storms, the worst storm in 30 years and massive amounts of flooding. No, I didn't hear all that. But yeah. Thank you again for being on the show. And uh, Mm -hmm. Let me let me stop the recording here. Hold on.